of you know me, I'm Reverend Cheryl Von Aaron Crook. I'm a member here at Kingston Congregational Church. I serve as a chaplain, but today I'm filling in for our senior pastor, uh, Pastor Jan, who is on a silent retreat at a monastery right now. Um, so if there are any pastoral emergencies during the week, um, please call the office and um, they will get in touch with me or one of the other pastors in the community that is on call for Dan.
Okay, please join me for the responsive call to worship. Jesus, follow me. Jesus said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus said, Forgive us seventy times seven. Jesus said, Be my sheep. In response, we say, Here's my heart, take it and seal it. Seal it for by the courts above. Let us worship God with all our hearts. Please stand as you are able and join in our opening hymn, number 245, The Day of Resurrection. For the last seven weeks, we have been following the faith of the most loyal disciples. Peter still made mistakes. He was faithful and afraid, loving and calm. We are a lot like Peter. Despite our belief, we despite our love, so let us return to God, blessing the truth. Let us pray together our prayer. We crawl out of without forgiveness and are surprised by abundance. We profess our faith and deny it. Over and wandering along the journey of faith, tether us to your heart. Forgive our surprise, our denial. We are eager to return to you. With humble hearts we pray. Amen. 
Friends, the first time that Peter saw Jesus after the crucifixion, asked him three times, do you love me? This repetition was not because Jesus doubted Peter's word. This repetition was Jesus offering Peter grace. You see, the last time Jesus and Peter were together, Peter said three times, I do not know that man. So when Jesus returned, he asked Peter, do you love me? And in that moment, he allowed Peter to turn his denials into love. Friends, the grace of our God knows no end. When we stumble, when we fall, when we deny God or cause harm, Jesus meets us where we are and offers us a second chance. So rest in this good news. Does God love you? Yes, yes, yes. God loves you. Thanks be to God for a love that never This morning we have a video. And we do not have children's church this morning, so um, this is actually not the dismissal hymn, so please feel free to stay in place or to come up and sit in the prayer space during the service. Apparently, we don't have the video. Eden will play our song and sing it to us this morning. This is this is a piece that we've been using throughout Lent.
things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to him, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. The disciples did not know Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side, and you will find it. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple, who Jesus loved, said to Peter, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging in the net full of fish, where they were not far from the land, only a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there <clears throat> with fish on it and bread. He said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter went on board and hauled the net ashore. Fish, 153 of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. And now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now, this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, John, do you love me? I know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, do you love me? He said to him, yes. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said a third time, Simon, <clears throat> son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, that I love you. Very truly, I will tell you. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would. unto you, O God, our rock, and by our redeemer. Amen. Today is from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John. Now previously, in the 20th chapter, John appears to have wrapped up this Gospel with words that make certain readers know Jesus. In verses 30 to 31, he writes, Now Jesus did many other signs, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Now according to Bishop John Shelby Spong, on this note, the fourth gospel comes to a conclusion, and we are left with the spirit that empowers us to be the body of Christ, doing the work of Christ in every generation. Except that there is another chapter, which most scholars call the epilogue, and believe that it may be the product of a different writer than the rest of the fourth gospel. But this is an important epilogue because it brings us back to Peter, whose wanderings we have been following 
throughout our Lenten journey. Chapter 21 opens with Peter's announcement that he's going fishing. Now, we all know that Peter is not a sport fisherman looking for an evening of relaxation on the lake. Fishing was the job at which Peter earned his livelihood. And it seems that Peter was announcing that it was time to pick up his pre-Jesus phase of life and go back to his day job. The trauma and grief connected with the crucifixion had be perhaps begun to fade and a return to normalcy was in order. Everyone who has ever gone through the experience of grief, no matter how wrenching, understands the transition to which Peter was referring. The six other disciples who are listed in this narrative decide to go along with him. In this scene, we are actually back in Galilee. It seems as if the disciples have returned to their previous occupation in the familiar hills of their homeland. It's as if they thought they were laid off from being disciples due to Jesus' absence. They don't get it. They don't get what they have been equipped to do. They went out in the boat and spent the entire night fishing, but caught nothing. Sound familiar? The first time that Simon met Jesus, he had also been unsuccessfully fishing all night. Now at daybreak, Jesus appears to the seven disciples on the shore, but they do not recognize him. He ascertains that they have not caught any fish. He directs them to cast their nets to the other side of the boat, and behold, they catch so many fish that they are struggling to haul in the net. Sound familiar? Jesus again directs the tired fishermen to where the fish are. And it is in this abundance, this moment, of grace upon grace that the disciples recognize Jesus and proclaim it is the Lord. They come on shore and find that Jesus has made a fire and is preparing fish and bread for breakfast. Jesus then took the fish and the bread, broke it, and gave it to them. Sound familiar? Jesus became a servant and washed the disciples' feet and fed them at the Last Supper. And now Jesus again provides more than ample sustenance with fish and bread, just as he did when he fed the 5,000. After breakfast, Simon, Jesus asked Simon Peter if he loves him. His reply is a resounding, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Then Jesus asked the same question again and gets the same response from Peter. Jesus instructs him, tend my sheep. Then a third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he'd said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, did Jesus really need to ask this question three times? Is, Peter ask, is Jesus asking Peter, do you really love me? 
or do you just kind of love me? Well, the exact meaning of Jesus' initial question is a little bit uncertain because what he actually asks is, do you love me more than these? Well, these what? These things of the world? Is Jesus referring to other objects that Peter might love? Or is he referring to the others present who might also love Jesus? It's not really clear. It could be either or both. Jesus wants Peter and us as well to love him more than anything or anyone. Now, some biblical scholars put forth two explanations for the repeated questions asked of Peter. And the first is rather scholarly indeed, and has to do with the Greek words for love. There are two Greek words for love used in this scripture, agape and philo. Now, agape means unconditional, sacrificial divine love it is considered the highest form of love and philo is brotherly love and refers to the love shared between close friends in the original greek the first two times jesus asks peter do you love me he asks, do you agape me and Peter responds, you know, I philo you. The third time, Jesus shifts to ask Peter, do you philo me? And Peter again responds, you know, I philo you. So this time, the words match up. But does this really matter? Does this affect the way you understand the conversation? Peter is promising brotherly love. Is Jesus asking for more? Is Jesus actually asking for unconditional sacrificial love? Well, Jesus hints that that is exactly what will ultimately be required of Peter when Jesus says, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. The Johannine author adds the parenthetical here that says, he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And then Jesus says, follow me. In this post-resurrection encounter, Jesus is inviting Peter to follow him in martyrdom and death. And while Peter's death is not actually described in the scripture, Numerous writers of the time, or shortly thereafter, have described his death as having occurred in Rome during the reign of the Emperor Nero in 64 CE. So if these accounts are accurate, then Peter did indeed lay down his life for Jesus in a sacrificial way, as Peter proclaimed that he would do back in John chapter 13, when Jesus foretold Peter's denials. So we know that Peter's love for Jesus is both philo and agape. But there's another way to understand the repeated questioning of Peter's love for Jesus and Peter's three answers. Jesus' answer, Jesus' questions to Peter and Peter's answer help counterbalance Peter's three denials of Jesus 
recorded in John chapter 18. Each time Peter affirms his love for Jesus, he gets to wipe away the stain of those three denials. This is great news for Peter, and it's great news for us as followers of Jesus. It might be a sobering exercise to look back over a day or a week or a year, examining our own words and actions to see if they deny or affirmed Jesus Christ. So we see that Peter got a do-over, and so do we. Jesus asks, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. Do you love me? Then tend my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. It's Peter's second call to ministry. It's our call to ministry. Remember back in the Gospel of Luke, we heard a similar call. It is in that story that Peter, then called Simon, is called first as a disciple and told that he will be catching people. Apparently, he didn't get it then. He thought he needed to return to fishing for fish. Now, Peter is instructed to feed Jesus sheep and to tend the sheep. The Greek word here that is used for feed actually means to nourish spiritually. And the Greek word for tend means to act as a shepherd, guarding and guiding a flock. Jesus uses shepherding imagery and language very prevalent at the time. Peter knows what this means. Jesus is putting him in charge of the lambs of God. This affirms Jesus' declaration to then Simon in the Gospel of Matthew that he is now Peter, the rock. And upon that rock, the church will be built. This time, Peter gets it. Do we get it? If you were to receive this charge in your own life, what does it look like for you to tend and feed God's sheep? Whatever sheep it is, that God is asking us to feed, we must know and accept that encounters with Jesus change lives. After our own encounter with Jesus, we can't return to our old way of living. Our entire lives become means for discipleship even if what we're doing may not seem particularly religious, we each, every one of us, have a ministry. And just as the first disciples had to learn that the gospel ministry continued beyond Jesus' earthly life, we must realize that the gospel ministry of our own lives continues past these walls, past the walls of the church, and past the Christian community and into the world. A relationship with Jesus not only turns our lives into a ministry, but also enables us to live that ministry. Jesus enables us and strengthens us to tend and to feed God's sheep wherever we are, whatever we are doing. Every
every day, Jesus says to each of us, do you really love me? Then tend and feed my sheep. So every day, do we answer unequivocally in our words and in our deeds? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Amen. Will you please join me in our affirmation of faith, which is printed in your worship guide or on your screen? We believe in a God who shows up in our lives, surprising and catching us off guard in the best of ways. We believe in a God who cares for God's people, a shepherd who longs for her sheep to be fed and tended. We believe in a God who took on flesh, a God whose love changed the world as we know it. We believe that this here and now God invites us out of the boat, calling ordinary people like Peter, like us, into a life of service and community. And so we give our hearts, we give our whole hearts, and nothing less. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 250 in your hymnal or on your screen. You may be seated. Reverend Cheryl to clarify how, how much time do I have to tell this story and she said about three minutes and then I found out that Doug was going next week and there's no way he's going to just take three minutes so <laughs> I'm just going to take some liberties here 
So we see in our bulletin that the theme of the UCC stewardship campaign is because of you, our church changes lives. And I am so, so, so grateful for all of you because this church has changed my life and now I can pay it forward. And I'll spend the next few minutes telling you about that. Let me take you back to the 1970s to another church in Northern Rhode Island. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but it was probably about seven. I do remember the defiant conversation I had in a pew with my poor mother. When is the female priest gonna go up there? <laughs> no, Michelle, it's only men that are priests. What, what do you mean that it's only, they, they don't let women be priests? That's just the way it is, Michelle. But mom, that's not fair. Yes, I was a mainline Protestant before I knew what that was. <laughs> Fast forward 30 more years, and now I have a daughter asking me the same question. All of a sudden, my young Jesse was looking up at me defiantly saying, what, what do you mean, Mom? And I had to decide how I was going to answer her. So my answer was, yeah, that's not fair, is it? Let's get out of here. Let's go make some good trouble. So I wandered for a few years. I became a nun. That's N-O-N-E. I didn't go to church. Mm -hmm. I'm among a growing number of young people at that time who have access to a lot of information and just didn't believe in religion anymore. I used to say, the beach is my church and I can see God in the sunrise. So I took my kids to the beach a lot. But it wasn't the same. I found that it was just too much for me to have to homeschool my kids on how to be a good human because I was still learning that myself in a room full of people who value higher education, I'm sure you can relate, you teach what you need to learn, but since I couldn't go back to the old church, I needed to find a new one, and here I am. It was actually my mom who suggested one day that maybe trying the church that dad works at is a good idea. So smart move, mom, and thanks, dad, for being my magnet, my church magnet. <laughs> The church has become my new spiritual home and one for my kids, flying its rainbow flag and proclaiming the good news that all are welcome here no matter where you are on life's journey. And that is good news, isn't it? And no, it's not just a thing we say here in church. The church is where we come week after week to practice being good humans, but then, as Reverend Cheryl said, we have to go out in the world and practice what we preach. You see, over the last eight years, I've come to understand that as members of this church, when we say all are welcome here, we're talking about the bigger here, as in the world. That's what Jesus taught. All are welcome to come and learn God's love, and all are welcome to teach God's love, not just the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests. Um, that has changed the way that I see the world and the way that I see religions of the world and it's changed the way that I serve the world. Fast forward a few more years, it was 2019, and I had the honor of serving this church as the communications and church school director. I had to relearn the Bible. My background was not in theology, it was in business, probably why I'm comfortable asking for money, but because I was a Christian, I had kids, I spent a couple of years here, I earned some trust, and because I had spent a few decades running a marketing communications, business, I was hired. I wasn't sure what I was doing, honestly, but I sure knew that God had a plan for me. So uh, I, I will confess, even with my dad in the room, that as a young girl who was mad at the church for not being fair to women, I had kind of stopped listening that closely. I was there in the church, but my mind wandered all the time. Now I was the teacher. And I had your beloved children in my classroom, and so I had to get it right. And I can just say that a church school classroom is a way better model for kids to learn and a, a brilliant way for a young mom to get the piece of, that she desperately needed to figure out her faith. I tried to sit in the cry room model, and it didn't work for me. The laughter classroom model is a lot better. <laughs> so now that I had to be a teacher and I had to relearn what Jesus taught us. 
one of the first lesson plans I created was for Pentecost. And I'm like, tongues of fire, all the languages. Was Jesus there that day? I had to look it up. I was bad at this. I have no idea why Gene Miller, Christian, Air, Christian Ed Chair at the time, thought I was good enough for both jobs, but she did. <laughs> Thank you, Gene, for that. Uh, you, Jean has become a treasured mentor in my life. She might remember the early days of having to coach me through that, that part of the job. Um, one day she even asked me if I had ever considered divinity school. And my answer was a firm no, but I could tell you the seven-year-old girl in me was smiling that day. I'll leave the job of spiritual leaders to the wise and wonderful reverends of our church. They do a far better job than I could ever dream of. It's not my path. But I'm a business leader, and I felt called to apply my skills and passions to starting a new business. So I did just that. It was time for me to step out of this boat, like Peter did, and uh, go out and feed the sheep. Because once your, life, once your life has changed for the better, you have to pay it forward. Once you can fully understand what Jesus really meant, by unconditional love for all people, you can no longer tolerate suffering in the world. It is inside this very church that I've learned how much power I have to make change out there, and so much change is needed. So I, I wrote 11 minutes, and I'm, I'm already getting long, so I'm gonna cut out some of this stuff, but I wanted to share another guy who stepped out of a boat about five miles to the east of here. His name was Roger Williams. Has anyone ever heard of it? <laughs> so we know that he believes in religious freedom. He also said cool things like, forced worship stinks in God's nostrils. <laughs> God is too large to be housed under one roof. So I want to focus on this phrase, only God's love will win over evil and ignorance. And I think in this world there's still a lot of evil and ignorance that we witness. Um, it's only God's love that will gain that real and lasting victory. Um, and it's our job, you know, we don't even have to start a church like Peter did or run a state like Roger did, but we do have to show up and pay our taxes and pledge the church and, and show up in our time and our talent and our resources. So the sheep need to be fed. Um, I know Helen is watching, she's literally feeding sheep. Um, we don't have to do that, but we do have to make a decision on how we're gonna show up. So you decide. Doug will tell you, you know, time, talent, and treasure, mostly, mostly treasure, uh, but every bit counts, you decide. So thank you, I hope I've d demonstrated that because of all of you, this church has changed my life, and because of your beautiful work, I'm empowered to go make positive changes in the world with my work. And I hope you'll join me in the financial support of our congregation. I'll stop talking now, thanks for listening. <laughs> Probably change our microphone to one of the cameras. Thank you. And on that note, we come to the time in our service to share our tithes and our offerings. Through the resurrection of Christ, we have been given new birth and living hope. So in thanksgiving and praise, let us bring our gifts to God. Let us just praise God.
of these gifts, may we become a more open people, open-minded in hearing your word and wisdom, open-hearted in healing a broken world, open-handed in heeding your call for charity and enacted love. With thanks for all good gifts, we present a portion of our substance and the whole of ourselves. Amen. Before I go to the prayers of the people, I just want to make a couple announcements that I neglected to make earlier. Shirley Schock had uh, asked me to correct an error she made on dates of the KCC photo book. Um, she had put dates in May, but it's actually April 14th and April 21st, so next week and the week after. Um, also, I forgot Oops. to make this announcement for Michelle. Um, it's soup and bread making, the beneficent big banquet. Beneficent banquet. The beneficent banquet. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a fundraiser. And you can um, look for Michelle after the service or give her a call. Um, and this is posted in Belgium. Thank you. thank you. And I would like to thank everyone that participated in the service today. Cheryl Wilda, Carolyn, Tia, Connie, Michelle, Lorianne, Frank, um, Julian, Dave, Ram, Louise, and Elizabeth, and I hope I didn't forget anyone. And um, first prayer request is for Audrey Ribbit, who has suffered major complications during surgery um, to repair a small aortic aneurysm and is very ill in uh, Rhode Island Hospital, so please pray for her. This prayer request is from Elizabeth M. Please pray for the family of Winifred Helfrich on her death last Wednesday. She was a member of this church. Services will be private, but a guest book and condolences um, locally will be at Avery Story Funeral Home. This is a prayer of joy requested by Linda and Angelo. Um, they're praying for Eden, not praying for, but um, they want to give a prayer of joy for Eden Castile. Thank you for all um, you do and the joyful evening this last Friday. <laughs> prayer of concern from Dick for his wife Loretta. Loretta is in the hospital after a fall yesterday, um, so please pray for her. A prayer of joy um, from Elizabeth Cashton, who welcomes her first grandchild on Thursday night. Wait a minute, I think this is for Cashton. That must be the child's name, and this is a request from Elizabeth S. Sorry. <laughs> um, a prayer of joy and gratitude from Joanne P., also for Eden. Um, thanking God for bringing her unique talent and music to us. A request uh, to pray for Barbara requesting comfort and healing.
prayer of concern request from um, Elizabeth Candace and Sage. I hope I said that right. Prayers for Judy and family on the passing of Kenneth John Scott. And a prayer request from Connie Fitzell for Andy requesting prayers for healing. Thank you. personal note from me, I want to thank you for your prayers and your cards and your best wishes on my recent surgery. Um, I had my two-week post-op uh, appointment on Friday, and things are on the mend, and I uh, am joyed that I'm able to be here this morning, um, and I pray for uh, continued healing. Let us pray. God of second chances and God of new life, we have spent our days wandering. Like Peter, we have milled about through nearly every stage of faith. We have had courageous days and convicted days, learning days and questioning days. We have had days where we run to you, days for diving out of the boat, days for deep joy, and days where the pain of the world feels too close to bear. And so, God, we bring our wandering hearts to you, and we ask that you draw us in. May today's story spark something new in us. Allow this story of grace to give us pause and pull us in. We are listening. Amen. And now as Easter people, let us join together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. that Jesus did after the resurrection was to feed his disciples. The Gospel of John tells us it was a beach fire, bread and fish, cooked over an open flame. Immediately, the disciples knew it was Jesus because Jesus was always feeding people. Jesus was always telling the left out and the ignored, the hurting and the hungry, the sick and the hopeful, I have a seat saved for you. Friends, that is why we come to this table 2,000 years later. We come to remember. We come to be close. We come to get a taste of the kingdom of God. So come hungry. Come seeking. Come with your wandering heart and your fickle faith and know that Christ has saved a seat for you. Christ always has a seat for you and nothing, nothing can ever change that. For 
this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of second chances, God of grace, meet us here just as you met the disciples at the beach. Meet us here. Meet us now. Walk towards us and gather us in. For God, like Peter, we have known storms. This week, people in this room have grieved. This week, people in this room have felt overwhelmed by the news cycle and helpless to make a difference. This week, people in this room have been lonely, stressed, or uncertain. You know the wind and wave like, oh God, you know the nature of our storms. So just as you walked toward Peter, walk toward us. Meet us here. Meet us now. Gather us in. Fortunately, like Peter, we have also seen you stop the storms. We have seen your fingerprints in our lives in ways we do not always expect. So with gratitude in our hearts, we come to you today to say thank you. Thank you for this church family that feels like a home. Thank you for the stars in the sky that remind us of your vastness. Thank you for stories of hope and forgiveness that inspire us to love. And thank you for the unending grace that encircles our wandering hearts. God, we have been back and forth, to and from, on this journey of faith. For every time that you walked the valley with us, for every time that you met us on the mountaintop, and for every time you stayed still while we ran to you, we give you thanks. Never stop meeting us here, meeting us now, gathering us in. And with the faithful in every place and time, we praise your holy name and say together, Holy, 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 God of power and love, the whole earth is full of your glory, O God most high and most near. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy One, we praise you for all your gifts. We remember your mercy to us, always calling us back to yourself when we have fallen into ways of violence. And we remember with thanks your greatest gift to us, your child, our sibling Jesus, who suffered the very violence we desire to renounce with the help of your saving grace. We remember that on the night that he was handed over, Jesus ate a meal with his disciples, a celebration of a liberating covenant. Among his friends at the table was the one who would deny him, was the one who had already betrayed him, and all who would abandon him. And yet, to each, he gave the same blessing and the same promise. He never lost hope that we would learn his way. While they were eating, he took bread from the table and after giving thanks, divided it, saying, this is my body broken for you. This bread demands the end of broken bodies. Take and eat everyone and remember him. And then he poured a cup. And said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This cup demands an end of bloodshed. Take and drink it, everyone, and remember him. 
here at KCC, we practice an open table. We invite anyone and everyone who wishes to partake in this feast to participate, and we welcome you with open hands and open arms. I invite the ushers to come forward. They will serve the bread to you. Please eat it when you are served to symbolize your personal relationship with God. And then they will come back and serve you the cup. Please hold the cup until all have been served and we will drink together to symbolize our unity and wholeness in Christ. This is the bread of life. Take and eat.
Let us pray. Thank you, God, for giving yourself to us in so many different ways. May we, too, distribute you to all in new ways, old ways, every way and any way, so that the hungry will be fed, the dying will have life, the lonely will be accompanied, the oppressed will have justice, and all of us together will rejoice in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 252, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Please stand as you are able and join in our closing hymn. Thank you.